So, Thomas, here we are with the partnership of uh, Xavier Ifkens, who are in the Royal Museum of Fine Arts, with your works uh, hanging on the wall. A few months ago, there was a, a works from the uh, Flemish painting in the 17th century. Now we have his vision, Californian vision. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the meaning for you to be in a museum? You know, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm of a generation that believes, or at least I believe, I'm, I'm an artist that really believes that we're part of a family of artists, that we, when, when, when you make work, you're part of a, an, a really ancient tradition of, of, of creativity. And um, so that's extremely meaningful for me, but I think these paintings represent, of course, a distillation of a lot of things uh, about me, and, and one of them is I'm a European artist. In some ways, I'm from the north of England, but I, I had this extremely powerful relationship to the history of European painting. It really guided me, it really helped me. And so to have like, you know, Bruegel as an artist, I had little poster of, uh, of Bruegel in my room when I was a kid. I, I really loved the visions of Bosch. I really, these kind of things really kind of fed my uh, imagination, fed my energy, fed my belief in images. So um, to, to come back with these paintings particularly and have them placed here is, you know, obviously, you know, as soon as Xavier began talking about the idea, it was that, you know, yes, 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 let's do this. Tell me when, you know. Yeah, and you are on the same floor, on the same level than uh, mm. Bruegel. We have seen Bruegel, we have seen also Jerome Bosch. You're talking about vision, but you're also talking about European tradition. Uh, yesterday, you were there with friends, and I asked you to one of your friends, but is it typical from California today from Los Angeles painting? Are you still European or more Californian in this kind of painting today? The paintings are, um, they're unimaginable to me. I couldn't have done them without being on, on the coast of Malibu. I mean, I was in treatment, so that's why I ended up in Malibu. And um, the light, the sense of color, the movement, uh, you know, the sun and the moon is these very, very powerful, uh, you know, fixtures uh, in the day and the night. So on that level, I couldn't have done them without it, but I also couldn't have done them without, you know, my sort of deep um, love and grounding in a part of me that's very European. It's very Northern, that's very romantic, actually. But I think the colors and the sense of nature as this very powerful force, is very Californian in some ways. I mean, it's the Pacific Ocean for me, and it's definitely um, the light of California. But then as I walked around just now, I'm looking at Flemish primitive paintings and similar sunsets, so similar colors actually. So, uh, and we have, so maybe a, I'm... Uh, we have a, a canvas there very close from the Northern tradition, like Munch, yeah. and this kind of landscape with the sea yeah. and this uh, a kind of depressive landscape. What, yeah. what's, the, what's the meaning of a landscape for you? Well, the meaning of a landscape in, in, in these still is about, um, in a weird way, salvation. The meaning that you, when you look at, at the world, I mean, these are real things. If, if, if you knew my place in Malibu, you would recognize some of these things as being very palpably from there. So for me, they represented my first realization that I was part of the landscape and the landscape was part of me and the sky and the ocean and the trees and everything I was in direct relationship to it and um, you know when you're in treatment there's there's a great poem we would we would say every day you know I'm a child of the universe just like the rocks and the trees this was a mantra that we said and so when I arrived in, in Malibu I truly felt I was a child of the universe, just like the rocks and the trees, and that's in these paintings. But you're coming from sculpture, and you're bringing color. What, what's the meaning to add color to your own sensibility, your own way to work? What's the color for a sculpture first, maybe? I always wanted to be a painter growing up. I wanted to, I, I looked at painting and I thought, I didn't really think sculpture was something possible in our time. And so I wanted to be a painter, and in a weird way, I was kind of like a, a painter that couldn't handle painting. My energy was so fraught and so intense that painting and its, its, its requirement of a kind of patience and a kind of um, 
belief in a kind of abstraction. Painting requires, you know, I, I know that this isn't really the landscape, right? Well, with my sculptures, I don't know that. My sculptures are really that. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't have the ability in terms of my nervous system uh, before to do that. And I think in this period of my life, uh, I was able to do that. And I think I literally began to see the world in color. I felt like blood was re-entering my veins. And these represent that. I began to, a lot of them look almost like blood vessels or lungs or I felt like I was breathing. And so I was starting to feel alive. I was starting to smell things, hear things that I'd never done before. And the, you know, I was trying to rep, I mean, really these began with me just trying to say, can I reflect what this process is going on in me internally? And technically, uh, are you working on such a work? In well, because series? I don't have much room, I can't get back from them. A lot of times on, the, on that deck, I worked outside the entire time because I didn't want to bring, this was the idea of, this, of, my, of, of one of my treatment guys, Danny Smith, was it's funny, you get very superstitious when you're very, very frightened. You get very superstitious, right? It's like everyone says, you know, when you're on a plane, you can get religious and they're like, God, make sure we land all right. And then you land and you're like, fuck God, I'm fine, right? From when you're scared, you get suspicious. So I was very scared, so I got very superstitious and I got like, well, if I paint a scary painting in my house, it's gonna stay in my house. So, um, and so Danny said, well, why don't you go outside and paint them outside? And it was like, oh, great idea. So I started painting them outside. And then I just got really into the, the feeling of the wind and the light and the smell of the ocean, the sound of the ocean. And so uh, I started working outside. So then I, they could get bigger because I was outdoors. And then um, on the deck, there's not that much room. So I had to paint with them flat a lot. You know, that was the best way to get distance, to climb up on a ladder and look down at them. And then once I started doing that, you know, it's, you just, I just started pouring, obviously, the paint onto them. And then you get a thing called sundowners, which is these very strong winds kick up sometimes in Malibu. It's like two weather systems at night kind of hit. And so you get, the wind just really intensely blows through the place. And then it would push the paint around in the night. Or flowers would fall on them or sage plants or things. Things started falling on them at night and they started getting blown around at night. So then when I came in the morning, there was kind of like, you know, it's kind of divine intervention, it's nature intervention. I had work with that. Yeah, but we, we, yesterday we, 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 we just chat and you, you were talking about chaos. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that chaos is everywhere on the canvas. But by the way, it's also the way to find back peace yeah. and to restore the peace. Yeah. Uh, you said some really interesting thing about the, the period of the COVID in relationship with this kind of works and the future of yes. creation. I, 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 think, I think for artists, um, you know, it, it has represented a very interesting opportunity. I mean, of course, there's, you know, tremendous amount of people have died, a tremendous amount of suffering. And so you don't want this, but it is there. It is what it is. Within that, as artists, I think our job is always to try to be hopeful, even when the work is bleak or even when the, we are provocative or whatever. That's hope, right? I mean, a lack of hope is you don't do anything. So I, I was lucky enough in a weird way to be going through a, through a sort of psychological repair and reassemblage as COVID was happening. I arrived back into the world, if you like, um, deeply hopeless. You know, I'd been in treatment, it hadn't really worked or it had or it hadn't. And, um, and I saw the world feeling really hopeless. You know, I sort of really noticed, you know, I lost a friend, a very dear friend during this period, I lost a couple of dear friends during this period. Um, and I realized then suddenly I, I got this um, kind of calling from this period that it was important to start reaching out and to start being active and a kind of, you know, I have, I have a guy who, who has helped me a great deal and he talks about ambassadors of hope, right? It sounds really cheesy, but in a way artists are ambassadors of hope. Even, again, even when they're bleak or they're being provocative or they're being anarchic or whatever, um, and so I felt very much that I was lucky enough to be around a group of people who supported me hugely, who were very there for me when I was fragile, and that I felt I needed to reflect back um, hope as it came into me and, um, and reach out and, and project out. And then I started getting really strong downloads from nature. 
that I could only describe as of sublime downloads. I, I was really, I, I mean, I'd learned to meditate and all this stuff in Arizona, um, but then when I really got into meditating, meaning, you know, you run up a trail for five miles and then you meditate, you're in this altered state. And then I started getting what I can only describe as like downloads, which were like these uh, energetic, almost like, um, like being a conductor. And so I was getting those downloads and I felt, I felt immediately it was very important for me to try to describe them. So in this room we have the, this kind of oceanic landscape, uh, mm -hmm. bringing back peace and sentiment, uh, a feeling of oceanic with colors. We have also drawings here, yeah, mm -hmm. just in the middle of the room. Yeah. Uh, what's the place of the drawing? Well, the drawings, when I was in recovery in Arizona, I couldn't, yeah, I didn't have a phone, you can't make art, you, you live a very tiny life. So art was sort of taken away from me. It was good in a way, you know, but, but I was having a lot of very intense experiences. And my only way to deal with intense experiences is to try to like either write them down or draw them. And um, these are the notebooks. I had this series of notebooks and then they just kind of grew. And everyone made fun of me there. Like I would just walk around with this black notebook all the time, you know, like furrowing around like a freak. And I'd, I'd show up at all the, the different groups with my, my book and all of this stuff. Um, and so it became essential to me, these drawings and these descriptions because I was holding on to the information I was getting and I was learning about my own brain and this I knew this stuff was extremely significant if I was going to survive so I was clinging to my books like wood driftwood in a in a flood you know what I mean and so I was writing sometimes really frightening things I was writing really uh, hopeful and I was and I was having certain experiences that um, and so what I love about this room, time is really interesting in this room. You've got me really small, kind of giving up on everything, really just living in this book like this size through to me being so zapped by nature and, and being in this really big portal. And from those drawings to the large canvas. You know, when I had the, the actual visions in Arizona, they were so powerful and so real. Um, that I was, you know, I was really kind of struggling with what was real, what's not, you know, what is going on? What, what is this my brain talking to me? Am I making it up? What the fuck is going on? So I drew them very, very small in my books to just, I jotted down notes. You can kind of see them like, yeah, the skeleton said this. And then, you know, they're really sweet actually. Now I look back at them and, you know, the floor looked like this. And now I'm trying to hold on to them, to, to just kind of hold on to them and, and make sense of them. And then once, uh, I started working, and once I felt on more stable ground... Um, so, sorry, but you, you call that vision mm. and not a uh, nightmare. No. It's more visual, it's, it's a, a real visual presence. Yeah, I see them as, as, as a, massive, uh, a massively helpful... I, I call them visions because they are in the best tradition of visions. What's the best tradition of visions? where you are prevented from, you are, you are given something from somewhere outside of yourself that allows you to reflect on life and gives you a gestalt whereby you can operate with more oxygen. And, you know, in Christian tradition, it's a vision and it shows you God, right? But, you know, visions go back, you know, they're, they're present in all cultures, they're present in pretty much every modality of art that something outside of yourself kind of shows you, gives you perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. And we, all the team here has really enjoyed to, to oh, spend so much month with you great. and with new works. Yeah, uh, thanks. It,